Good afternoon. My name is Lexi Clark and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. I'd like to welcome you to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending this afternoon's program. The Dole Institute Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the hard work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan an SAB-sponsored program every semester. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy today's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. If you prefer to write us a note, there will be a notepad and pens on the table as you exit the building. Your attendance and feedback help us shape future programming. Before we begin today, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview and the program, we will have some time for some audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will come to a microphone and have you and come help you. Please ask just one brief question. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Valentine. Thank you for joining us today. This is the last of the Fort Leavenworth Cold War series. Uh, we have another series in the works on uh, World War II that should start uh, winter uh, sometime February or March. Uh, so I hope you'll keep your eyes open for information about that and that you'll come join us on that as well. Um, today our speaker is Dr. Robert Bauman. Uh, Dr. Bauman uh, has a PhD from Yale in uh, Russian history. He has spent several years working and living in the Soviet Union, and he is a prolific author. He is the uh, author or co-author of uh, numerous articles and books. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, is uh, the Russian-Soviet unconventional wars in the Caucasus, Central Asia, and Afghanistan. He was a member of the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College for 19 years, and in 2004, he moved from the department to take over as the Director of Graduate Degree Programs for the Command and General Staff College. Um, he is uh, a, an engaging speaker, and I think you'll enjoy him very much. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Bauman. Thank you very much. Um, my point of departure uh, will be uh, from the frame of reference of one who was a graduate student doing a year of doctoral research as an exchangee at Moscow University when the Soviet war in Afghanistan began. Uh, so it's uh, from that point in time uh, that I'll start. I can see as I look across the audience that many of you lived through much of the Cold War just like I did. Uh, not necessarily from exactly the same perspectives, but I'm sure we saw a lot of the same things. Uh, what was striking in Moscow uh, when I first arrived there in the summer of 1979, prior to what we refer to as the Soviet invasion, uh, was that at that moment, uh, relations seemed on the whole to be pretty good. Uh, detente, uh, which had started really in the early uh, 70s with uh, the SALT I Treaty and uh, President Nixon's visit to the Soviet Union, still had momentum. And uh, we were embarking on new areas of exchange and cooperation uh, with the Soviets. Uh, I had every expectation uh, when I arrived in the summer of 1979 in Moscow and got settled in the university uh, that this would be an interesting year. I had no idea how interesting. Uh, I also expected that uh, I would be accomplishing lots of work, and I really did not expect a spike intentions in U.S.-Soviet relations at that time. Uh, so there were a number of surprises uh, in store for me. Uh, in fact, I had only been there about uh, a few weeks when there was a uh, relatively famous flap at uh, Kennedy Airport uh, that uh, a few of you might remember. The Soviet Bolshoi Ballet had been touring the United States at the time as, as part of this uh, improved atmosphere. Uh, and when they were going to depart the United States, it turned out that one member of the ballet decided he wasn't going back. Uh, we used to call this defection uh, in the old days. Um, what complicated the matter was that not only had he dropped off the tour, but he had informed the FBI that his wife didn't want to go back, but she was on the plane. Uh, so the uh, Soviet airliner is held up at JFK Airport for quite a number of hours uh, while uh, U.S. officials have to board the plane and check out to make sure she isn't being taken away uh, under coercion and so on and so forth. Well, to uh, make a long story short, uh, she did go home. She said she wanted to go home. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure how that was all resolved uh, years down the road. She may have left after all. Uh, but, the, uh, but the point is things such as that showed how quickly uh, the relationship could turn and how complicated things could become in, in a hurry. Uh, that was also a time when, uh, uh, especially with the region of Central Asia and in particular Afghanistan, uh, the Iranian Revolution was underway. Uh, all the uh, complications uh, about uh, what to do about the Shah, uh, where he'll get medical treatment and whatnot, uh, were all uh, afoot. Uh, the uh, return of the Ayatollah uh, to Tehran uh, was uh, underway. Uh, so there was an awful lot going on. And then, of course, you had the seizure of hostages at the uh, US Embassy. So that was also part of the backdrop. Uh, the context uh, for Afghanistan uh, itself is something that I plan to go through for you now uh, in, uh, in brief. I understand there may be some questions. I'll ask you, uh, in the interests of moving this along, to hold your questions till the end. I'll be happy to answer them. And if we run out of formal time, I'll answer more questions informally uh, when we're done. Uh, but to push this along, uh, it would be best if I take questions at the end. When I was preparing this presentation, uh, it occurred to me the, the most difficult part is going to be to try to compress my observations into about 45 minutes. And uh, I, I was really tempted just to come in and say, well, I, I cast aside the time limit and go merrily for three hours, and I hope everybody brought a lunch. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm, uh, I'm advised that's really not the best way to go on this. Uh, so what, uh, what you see there is the, uh, the Moscow skyline on uh, the far left side of the picture, if you can see that. My angle from here doesn't, uh, doesn't show me anything. It's, it's night, uh, incidentally. So if the picture appears dark, uh, there's good reason for that. Uh, it is uh, the uh, silhouette of Moscow University, uh, which sits up in Lenin Hills, uh, overlooking the river. And from a distance, you can see central Moscow and the Kremlin, and uh, so on and so forth. So that was my, uh, my vantage point from Moscow. Um, in Afghanistan, meanwhile, uh, things were uh, already quite complicated, although relatively few folks in the world uh, took notice. Again, against the backdrop of uh, uh, Carter Brezhnev summit, negotiations on the SALT II Treaty, uh, which uh, would have to be set aside uh, once the Soviets uh, entered Afghanistan. Uh, all of this was, uh, was taking place and uh, much overshadowing uh, things that were happening uh, locally. The Soviet Union, uh, which on this map is represented not just by the red zone, but by the dark shaded gray zone underneath, because remember, this was before the breakup of the Soviet Union and the loss of all of what are now the Central Asian states. So you can see it at the time, uh, it uh, bordered Afghanistan. And the Soviets, in fact, had been for decades making a considerable investment uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, they certainly had an agenda. There had been lots of aid projects. They'd helped uh, build the Great Ring Road. There had been uh, dams built, uh, buildings they'd added to the university, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, they'd also been in the midst of building a client state. That is to say, uh, they had been slowly molding Afghanistan uh, to become a state in the, uh, in the Soviet orbit. And uh, you get a look at the, uh, the map of Afghanistan it, itself. Uh, let me mention right now that Afghanistan is quite uh, ethnically diverse. This is a subject that Americans have had a lot more opportunity to become familiar with through the news uh, over the preceding uh, uh, 10 years until today. Uh, along the border uh, with the, uh, the other stands, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan there, again, then part of the Soviet Union, uh, there is considerable ethnic overlap. Put another way, uh, many uh, Turkmen uh, live on the Afghan side of the border, uh, many Uzbeks live on the Afghan side of the border, and many Tajiks live on the Afghan side of the border. Uh, so there was considerable ethnic overlap between the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. This was also true on the Pakistani side, uh, which is a matter that has come to great attention, again, in recent years. And that would be the uh, Pashtun population, uh, which is almost equally balanced on both sides of the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and has been the source of endless political complexity uh, for, uh, for quite a number of years. Indeed, since the establishment of the Durand Line in, uh, in 1893, which set the border uh, based on lots of scientific topographical indicators uh, and taking into account some strategic considerations of the British Empire, 
but giving almost no account uh, to the ethnic complexion of uh, Afghanistan or what was then uh, India. The evolution of the Afghan flag is uh, one way to begin to trace uh, what's taking place. 1978-79, uh, the red flag becomes the official flag of, uh, of Afghanistan. This is in the wake of what the Soviets and uh, members of the People's uh, Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the PDPA, would refer to as the April 1978 revolution. Uh, they had cast it in the template of the Russian Revolution and other uh, so-called uh, socialist revolutions, some real, some not. But they put it in that tradition and suggested that this was a, a major historic milestone. What you essentially had really was a coup uh, by the PDPA uh, to take power and begin to mold Afghanistan in a different direction. Uh, they had done this uh, rather aggressively. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the pupils, uh, so to speak, can be more energetic uh, than their mentors hope. Uh, this is certainly the instance here. In 1978, when the PDPA uh, took power, uh, with many members of its leadership uh, having been schooled extensively in the Soviet Union, uh, having bought into the doctrines of Marxism, Leninism, having studied the history of the Russian Revolution, uh, they thought that they could superimpose all of this rather readily on Afghanistan, disregarding pretty much the local history, culture, and so forth. And this was among Afghans themselves. Uh, so they immediately embarked on a series of Soviet-style reforms uh, that created a major backlash. To further complicate the plot, the PDPA was seriously torn uh, internally between two factions uh, that uh, at times were violently opposed, not merely in, uh, in opposition. Uh, so the new regime was inherently unstable in a couple of very important ways. It was not at peace with itself, and it was quickly, quickly putting itself uh, in a state of conflict with the Afghan population at large. Uh, and that instability uh, is going to be the biggest factor in leading the Soviets to conduct what we will hail as the Soviet invasion uh, of Afghanistan. Oddly enough, the Soviets had actually tried to restrain uh, their, uh, uh, their pupils on more than one occasion, telling them, hey, look, you want to slow this down. You're, you're making an awful lot of trouble for yourselves. Um, in the meantime, in the course of uh, late uh, 1978 and through most of 1979, you'd actually had appeals from the Afghan government for Soviet military assistance to quell the uprisings in the countryside. Uh, these appeals will seem rather strange subsequently when the Soviets do invade and as a first step will replace the existing government. And oh, by the way, the second flag uh, is a flag that's uh, created uh, after the Soviet invasion as one of the steps to ameliorate popular discontent in Afghanistan with uh, the regime created by the 1978 revolution. Uh, the red flag, uh, the zealots felt, would make the, uh, the national flag consistent with the colors of revolution and indicate they're part of the worldwide movement and so on and so forth. Um, that, needless to say, was not broadly popular uh, with, the, uh, with the Afghan population. One of the things that clearly stood out uh, was the fact that the Soviet Union was very publicly an atheist regime. Uh, and Afghanistan, that didn't play well. The other flag, the black, red, and green flag, uh, was uh, much more traditional and an indication of the fact that the, the Soviets and the man that they installed uh, in power understood that an awful lot of fence mending was going to be necessary if they had any hope of saving the regime in Afghanistan. Here are a couple of, of the figures who were so instrumental uh, in, the, uh, in the transition. Uh, you had a republic created by a coup in 1973 uh, with the replacement of Zahir Shah, the ruler of Afghanistan. Uh, Mohammad Daoud Khan uh, then uh, becomes the prime minister, uh, and he will be ousted in a coup 
backed by the PDPA, to which I referred the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, in 1978. So things are moving along very rapidly uh, politically. Other things uh, that will be uh, tea leaves. Now, in 1978, as uh, an insurgency uh, begins to develop in Afghanistan, and, and various bands start to pursue various agendas, uh, one of the things that happens uh, is that the sitting United States ambassador, uh, Adolf Dove, uh, Dubs, rather, is killed um, when the U.S. Embassy uh, is grabbed. He's kidnapped. And uh, in an effort to rescue him in a local uh, hotel, uh, he is uh, killed in the, uh, in the crossfire. The PDPA leadership, uh, Nur Muhammad Taraki and uh, Hafizullah Amin, are the two men who are heading the Kalk faction of the, PD fa faction of the PDPA uh, that is now running Afghanistan. Unfortunately, uh, they can't get along with one another. Um, and indeed, uh, Taraki goes to Moscow uh, and is already letting it be known that he has a, a scheme to take down uh, uh, Taraki, I mean, rather Amin, excuse me. Uh, and Amin, in turn, has heard of this and is already hatching a plan to take out Taraki upon his return uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, Amin uh, will succeed, uh, Taraki will be killed, and Amin will be sitting on top uh, the, uh, the hierarchy of power in Afghanistan for at least a short time. One of uh, Amin's number one concerns is to reassure the Soviets uh, that he is really their guy. Unfortunately for him, uh, the Soviets are aware uh, that he's been having at least some back-channel conversations with the United States, conversations that uh, suggest he's hedging his bets in terms of uh, which international players uh, he might want to deal with in the long run. Uh, so his personal agenda uh, is, OK, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. Yeah, I'm working with the Soviets, and, and he will go out of his way to at least make public displays of loyalty. For example, Amin will address the United Nations uh, in Russian, just to, uh, just to make a point. But the Soviets, in the end, don't trust him. Furthermore, uh, they seem to think that he's incompetent and at least in terms of maintaining stability uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, so they're concerned uh, that he's going to bring the whole house of cards down. The Soviets have uh, a really big decision to make uh, when it comes to determining whether or not to invade Afghanistan. Now, I use the word invade uh, cautiously uh, because, in fact, you already had several thousand Soviet advisors in Afghanistan, many there at the behest of the Afghan regime. So to be clear, there's already an appreciable Soviet presence there. There have also been many technicians, and as I said, there have been many uh, aid and construction projects going on. So the Soviets have had a decades-long track record of being involved in Afghanistan. What we refer to as the invasion of Afghanistan involves the insertion of large numbers of Soviet troops and a military takeover of the regime in Kabul with a hand-picked Soviet replacement who will be installed in power. In the fall of 1979, when the leadership of the Politburo is discussing options, uh, there is some concern that going into Afghanistan this way could be a big mistake. And indeed, the Soviets will have rejected a series of requests from the Afghan regime to send large numbers of forces in to quell what is a nascent insurgency on the periphery of Afghanistan. However, an inner core of uh, Soviet players, uh, beginning with uh, the General Secretary of the Communist Party, uh, Leonid Brezhnev, and a few of his key advisors, uh, will ultimately uh, make the decision in kind of a small group huddle. And their decision, in, made in, essentially in November, executed in December of 1979, is that uh, we'll conduct the invasion. The fundamental reason is that they cannot accept the prospect that Afghanistan might retreat from its current path to become a member of the Soviet political orbit. Uh, 
indeed, uh, probably the, the underlying thinking is uh, contained in what was referred to as the Brezhnev Doctrine. Uh, some of you will recall that in 1968, the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia in order to keep it in the uh, Warsaw Pact and the Soviet or orbit. Prior to that, in 1956, there had been an invasion of Hungary. Uh, boiled down to its essentials, the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine stipulated that you know, once you're in the community of socialist states, you're not pulling back out. So not only are they thinking in terms of the Brezhnev Doctrine, uh, but they're also thinking in terms of the prior examples of its implementation. When the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia in 68, they used a template that they would try to employ again in, uh, in 1979. Uh, they used special operations forces, uh, inserted them quietly, little by little, on assorted sundry nonviolent missions into the capital, Prague, waited till the time was right, and then they immediately seized key communication centers uh, in Prague, uh, made it nearly impossible for the uh, uh, Czechoslovak army uh, to respond in a timely way, uh, to, to a degree paralyzed the Czechoslovak government, making it much easier for them to orchestrate a rapid takeover. While that's occurring in Prague, invasion forces have already crossed the Czechoslovak frontier from multiple directions and including forces from some of the other Warsaw Pact states. So the president of Czechoslovakia, Alexander Dubček, is presented with a quick fait accompli. I can either fight, he feels, a futile fight uh, costing the lives of perhaps thousands or even tens of thousands of Czechoslovak soldiers, or I can face the inevitable and capitulate to the Soviets. He will take the latter option. The Soviets are hoping, seemingly expecting, that that's the scenario that will play out in 1979 in Afghanistan. The man the Soviets intend to install in power is uh, Babrak Karmov, also a member of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, uh, but a member of the faction that had opposed Taraki and Dami. Uh, he had actually left Afghanistan and was kind of under Soviet protection because it was a little bit dangerous for him to be in Afghanistan during the uh, uh, Taraki Amin regime. So once again, the internal Afghan politics, at least within the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, are so dysfunctional uh, to the point of violence uh, that it uh, guarantees a high degree of turbulence. But Bob Rock Karmal, they decide, is, uh, is their man, and he's a willing partner. Among those uh, who will offer advice uh, before the invasion is uh, General Mahmoud Gariev, uh, who will later become chief of Soviet ground forces. He will caution uh, the, uh, the Politburo that they may have seriously underestimated uh, the size of the force necessary to quell the insurgency in Afghanistan. The Soviet force will ultimately get up to uh, the neighborhood of 115,000 or so troops uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, as far as he's concerned, that's just a down payment on what you would probably need in the end. Soviet uh, uh, KGB uh, leadership will be very active in uh, assessing the situation in Afghanistan, in this case, uh, Vladimir uh, Kruchkov. Um, so they too will have their say uh, in, uh, in the Politburo, and they too are, uh, are somewhat cautious. I've talked a bit about the, uh, uh, the problems faced by the PDPA. Bottom line, again, as, uh, as noted here, as uh, public Marxists and atheists, essentially, uh, they're easily branded as, uh, as infidels. At least uh, Christian invaders, if they're perceived as invaders in Afghanistan, uh, have the uh, consolation of being so-called uh, people of the book, uh, which means that you do have a place in the Islamic worldview, uh, not so for, uh, for atheists. Ahmed Shah Massoud will become one of the foremost players in the insurgency. Uh, he is a Tajik uh, who will work largely in the uh, Panjshir Valley in uh, northeastern Afghanistan. He will later become known as the Lion of Panjshir uh, because he successfully uh, on multiple occasions, manages to fight uh, and resist the, uh, the Soviets. 
he proves the fundamental kind of tactical operational problem that the Soviets are going to face. The Soviets will annually, and it becomes almost a rite of spring, uh, send a sizable, oh, division-sized force on operations through the Panjshir Valley to clear out the Mujahideen resistance. And annually, uh, the Soviet forces will push through the valley about as far as they want to go. They can do it. They've got, the, they've got the force. But the Mujahideen will occupy the hills and the ridges and the nooks and the crannies and will stage all kinds of ambushes. They will not stand still and give the Soviets a real battle uh, because that's the kind of fight that the Soviets are virtually guaranteed to win uh, given their firepower and tactical proficiency. Instead, they will stand back. They will bend but not break. Uh, they will retreat into the mountains, and when the Soviets pull back, they will follow them with further harassing fire and inflicting as many casualties as they can. Uh, so the Soviets come to the unwelcome uh, revelation by 1982 uh, that they're fighting a war that's not going very well, and they're going to have to change their approach. So the Soviets will come up with, uh, in a way, their version of counterinsurgency doctrine. Uh, they will certainly adjust their tactics. They'll adjust their tactics back to, in a way, reintegrate some old patterns of thinking and operating uh, from the Russian army. The Soviets had actually had, historically, plenty of experiences waging guerrilla fights. Uh, they had done it at the end of World War II in Lithuania and uh, Ukraine. Uh, they had done it in Central Asia to liquidate the Basmachi resistance uh, back in the 1920s and even into the 1930s. And the Russian army, uh, had spent half a century doing it uh, in the Caucasus, uh, for example, against uh, the Chechens and others. So there's a lot of his historical experience to draw upon. Um, unfortunately, the Soviets had developed, after World War II, kind of a one-track mind. We're going to be a great conventional army. And indeed, they were pretty darn good. Uh, what they wanted to do, however, was not well geared to this situation. So they had to pull back and rethink and retrain. They will create uh, mountain warfare training centers in the Caucasus and Central Asia. Uh, they will start to focus more on helicopter-borne uh, troop movements. They will have more specially trained forces uh, who can fight in small units and work on ridge lines and uh, at high altitude and so on and so forth to become more tactically adept. In the meantime, they will run uh, parallel operations uh, governmentally to try to placate the Afghan population. Uh, there will be more aid projects, there will be extensive propaganda, they will try to negate the impression that they are anti-Islamic, uh, they'll resuscitate uh, Islamic radio programming uh, in Afghanistan, for example, and do lots of other things to show that, hey, we really are you know, friends uh, with Islam and friends with, uh, uh, with Afghans. Unfortunately, this was hard to do simultaneously, uh, while they're using incredibly firepower-intensive techniques to subjugate areas uh, that are occupied or occasionally occupied uh, by the resistance. Several Afghan scholars uh, during the 1980s will start to use the term migratory genocide to, take, to describe what's taking place in Afghanistan. It seems that the Soviet strategy, uh, perhaps slightly simplified, was uh, that you can eliminate guerrilla resistance if you drive the population completely out of the area. Guerrillas, and this is normally a working assumption with respect to guerrillas, uh, they require a population uh, from which they can draw essential resources from food to recruits. If you take away the population, they've got no place to hide and they've got no friends. The Soviets will uh, bomb extensively. Uh, there will be heavy use of artillery and armor. Uh, the, they will rubbleize uh, virtually uh, broad swaths of Afghanistan. The result will be, uh, then in, in addition to hundreds of thousands of Afghan casualties, that literally millions of Afghans will flee the country. This will create huge refugee zones, uh, particularly in Pakistan, but also in Iran. Uh, the number of refugees in Pakistan was estimated uh, up in the neighborhood of uh, 4 million. So we're talking a very large fraction, somewhere around a third, perhaps, of the Afghan population was literally driven out of the country as a result of the, uh, the Soviet techniques. 
So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that it was difficult to win over the population at the same time this is going on. Suggests kind of a strategic disconnect. It's also real hard to, uh, uh, as you might say, put the horse back in the barn you know, once you've done all this. It's hard to mend your fences once this much destruction has occurred. Uh, so the Soviets are facing a difficult proposition. In the meantime, they're trying to secure the capital, uh, which they will wrap in security, uh, and uh, they will try to keep their government uh, in Afghanistan under uh, uh, Babrak Karmal afloat. Other players, uh, Haluma is interesting characters in all of this, uh, the president of Pakistan at the time, uh, Zia al Haq. Uh, Zia had, in fact, been uh, encouraging resistance along the periphery of Afghanistan even before the Soviet invasion started. Uh, he was a little concerned about what the Soviets had in mind there. Uh, once the Soviet invasion occurs, uh, he will have an opportunity to become friends once again with the United States. He had been frozen out a little bit since he had, been, since he had taken power by coup uh, a short time earlier. Now he had a chance to get back in the uh, reasonably good gracious, graces of the Carter administration, who needed a friend somewhere in the region uh, if the U.S. was going to exert more pressure on the Soviets and try to neutralize uh, their program in Afghanistan. So Pakistan then becomes the conduit for all kinds of assistance that will e eventually flow uh, to the Mujahideen uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Pakistan will also become uh, the sponsor of uh, guys like uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, uh, folks uh, and organizations that are, we consider from a U.S. perspective, uh, to be quite a nuisance today. Um, so some of them have uh, early origins. But any, in any case, among the Pashtun population, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan uh, finds a friendly medium in which to, uh, to work its influence. President Carter's national security advisor, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, had in fact uh, already put on the table months before the Soviet invasion uh, the thought that it might not be a bad idea uh, to give at least some moral, uh, if not uh, small-scale material support uh, to insurgents out there on the fringes of Afghanistan. Uh, so the uh, United States had to some degree anticipated uh, what might happen and had been proactively working on the problem uh, just a little bit. Indeed, uh, Brzezinski had a hunch uh, that the that Soviets might plunge in in a big way and get themselves uh, seriously ensnarled in a major geopolitical military problem. More of the context, and this was uh, something I was dealing with at Moscow University at the time. Moscow was going to be host to the summer 1980 Olympics. And this was going to be a truly spectacular event in the Soviet Union. It had been much anticipated and was much ballyhooed. I can remember in the dormitory in uh, Moscow University as you entered the cafeteria, uh, there was a, uh, a sign with a daily countdown. You know, how many days left before the, uh, the summer Olympics? And Moscow University was going to be extensively involved. The dorms in Moscow University were going to be housing uh, for some of the uh, mainly East European tourists. Uh, and the, uh, the, the cafeteria would be used by a good many of them. And a lot of uh, students from uh, the Moscow State University, where I was, uh, would be assisting as uh, tour guides and translators and uh, things of that sort. So the, the university was all uh, uh, a Twitter uh, waiting for the uh, Olympics to arrive. This, of course, uh, will become problematic once uh, the Soviets actually invade. The invasion takes place uh, over several days, roughly from the 24th to the 27th of December, 1979. And as the elegance of uh, timing and luck would have it, uh, the Soviets were actually staging uh, their uh, special operations forces, the, the, the Spetsnaz and Airborne, uh, from uh, Tashkent, the capital of modern Uzbekistan, which is just a uh, couple hour flight away uh, from, uh, from Kabul. And as, as luck would have it, several times during that span, I, I personally was passing through uh, Tashkent Airport uh, because I had been traveling uh, through Central Asia on my winter break from the university because one of my interests had been the history of uh, Central Asian culture and the history of the old Imperial Russian campaigns in Central Asia. So little did I know that the next episode was breaking out 
just as I was passing through. Um, indeed, the first I really heard about it, giving any kind of detail, uh, was uh, when I returned to Moscow and was reunited with my shortwave radio and started to catch up with the news. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, that's what was happening. So that explains all the excitement at Tashkent Airport, uh, for example, uh, which was in fact a staging point uh, for, the, uh, for the airlift. Before the summer games, of course, you had the winter games. And prior to the Winter Games, President Carter had already begun open speculation uh, in the public domain that the U.S. might decide to boycott and indeed organize a broader boycott of the Summer Olympic Games. As part of the clever planning of this, uh, they decided uh, to get into the Winter Games before he has to make a decision of this sort. But the general message to the Soviets is, look, back out of Afghanistan, or this is one of the things the United States is probably going to have to do uh, as a result. Meanwhile, the Winter Games uh, brought uh, Americans the solace of the, uh, the Miracle on Ice, uh, the great uh, hockey victory over the Soviets, uh, which uh, to this day seems almost inexplicable. You watch the movie and it kind of makes sense, uh, but you step back, and, uh, and I was a big hockey fan at the time. I regularly went to uh, Soviet hockey games and watched uh, their big league teams, uh, and I knew full well uh, what uh, this bunch of American college kids was, uh, was going to be playing against. And uh, I was so convinced that the U.S. team had no chance, I did not bother to go to the dorm TV room. Of course, it, the game was on in the middle of the night due to the time difference uh, to watch the U.S. and the, uh, the Soviets play. So I was flabbergasted the next morning when uh, uh, in the dorm elevator a couple of uh, uh, Russian students congratulated me on uh, uh, the events of the, of the night before. And I said, you're kidding. We won? Um, the odds of that uh, were uh, astronomical in my estimation, but, uh, uh, but it happened. March 21st then, President Carter announces that there will be uh, an Olympic boycott. It was controversial in the United States, uh, as uh, some of you may remember. Uh, there was a great difference of opinion here as to whether or not the U.S. ought to sully the Olympics by boycotting it. Over this, uh, over this event. And then, of course, you had the uh, American Olympians themselves uh, who had sacrificed so much to be able to go. Uh, they dearly wanted uh, to, uh, to be able to go. Uh, but in point of fact, uh, the boycott would be announced and the president would get 50-odd uh, other countries to join in uh, the boycott. I essentially at the time got to watch the response from, uh, from Moscow. And the Soviets finessed this rather carefully because they did not want there to be a public perception that the Olympic boycott had anything to do with the invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, rather, they build this as more anti-Soviet militancy on the part of the U.S. and in particular President Carter, which I found ironic at the time because President Carter did not have the image of a militarist domestically. Uh, but to Soviet citizens, he was a saber-rattling menace uh, to, uh, to peace and someone with whom the Soviets simply uh, had found they could no longer deal. Uh, and the uh, Olympic boycott was just one manifestation of that. Uh, the map uh, shows in green uh, the countries that participated in the Summer Olympics, ultimately. Uh, the gray countries did not. Uh, there were some countries that split the difference uh, you'll see a few that are light green. They would send Olympic teams, but not under their national flag. So they would be sending athletes, but they wouldn't officially be participating as a country. This was another political option. Now, one of the things that is important during wartime is public leadership from the top. Leonid Brezhnev was probably not the first guy you'd pick to inspire the country in a war effort. To begin, Soviet politicians, especially at the very top, were essentially invisible gray men. Uh, always seen, uh, but never in any kind of unofficial stance. He had no personal profile other than as general secretary of the party and head of state, uh, whose face was ubiquitous on billboards uh, around the country with uh, inspirational slogans about socialist competition and, and this and that. Uh, but otherwise, uh, he was unknown. He was the antithesis of a dynamic speaker. Uh, he 
spoke in low kind of hushed tones, he mumbled a lot. Uh, he was already uh, in a state of seriously deteriorating health. Um, and this was evident to the folks who watched him in public. Uh, it just so happened that at, at one of the hockey games that I went to in Moscow, uh, it was Spartak against uh, somebody else, and I can't remember who the, uh, who the opponent was, probably Moscow Dynamo, because uh, it was a packed crowd in the uh, sports palace. And I happened to notice uh, across the arena from me, sitting in the VIP booth, uh, were uh, Brezhnev and several other key members of the uh, Politburo. Uh, Chinyenko, I think, uh, 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 Kasigan, and um, several others. So I spent at least half the game watching what was going on in the VIP box just to see you know, what, whether there would be some lively banter, interest in the game, what have you. Uh, rumor on the street was that uh, Brezhnev was a Spartak fan. Nobody knew that for sure, but that was widely, widely believed. Uh, in any case, my observation of the VIP box told me only that, boy, these are some pretty dull guys because there was scarcely any conversation through the entire game, you know, let alone cheering or, or anything else. Um, uh, they might as well have been at the opera uh, for all the activity uh, that was going on up there. <clears throat> then, of course, we'll have a uh, change in presidents uh, fairly early in the war, and at least the rhetorical tone will escalate still further uh, with uh, the arrival of, uh, of President Reagan. One of the things that interested me, and uh, I'll make brief mention of here, was the way the Soviets presented the war at home. The Soviets took an approach that, uh, to me at the time, was, uh, was kind of novel. Uh, they essentially pretended there was no war going on. Given that general posture, of course, Brezhnev couldn't step forward and be much of a wartime leader anyway, even if he had the uh, persona and the disposition uh, to be that guy. And oh, by the way, he'll die in 82 and be replaced by uh, uh, Andropov, who will die two years later, be uh, replaced by Chernyenko, who will die in about a year and be replaced by Gorbachev. Uh, so uh, they'll be moving through the older generation uh, until they get to Gorbachev, and then you'll have someone who will finally engage the public. Uh, but for the first four years or so uh, of the war, there will be scarcely any acknowledgement uh, that there's a war. Uh, so the Soviet public will know basically nothing about what's going on in Afghanistan. One data point uh, to kind of indicate you know, how extreme this was, Soviet citizens did not know what the official casualty total was in the war in Afghanistan until 1988, fully eight years into the war. They were not told. Uh, press reports for the first four years of the war never described combat, let alone acknowledged casualties. It was said uh, that Soviet parents uh, did not know often for months uh, that their sons had been killed in Afghanistan. And often the story would be that it was in a training accident. On the other hand, since the uh, Soviet army at that time was discouraging public funerals for soldiers killed in Afghanistan, uh, there was darn little to be known or seen. Uh, one of the indicators uh, that I got of the level of secrecy was that about three months into the war, uh, while I was a student, through a friend of friend of friends of friends, uh, there was a guy who was working at Sheremetyev Airport uh, who passed word out that, you know what? Um, they're bringing in body bags, you know, several nights a week after midnight, you know, as in the shadows, so nobody knows. Um, and this was one of those little indicators uh, that folks would get that, that something bigger was happening than what they actually knew. One of the remarkable things about the Soviet society was that in an information vacuum, you know, where there were no sources to information other than what you could get officially, unless you had a shortwave radio, and even then it was hard because there might be jamming, reception might be bad, and so on and so forth. Remember, uh, for more youthful members of the audience, this, is, this way predates the internet and any other form of modern communications that, uh, uh, that you might think of. So Soviet citizens really did live in a cocoon in which it was incredibly hard to get information from the outside. And yet, uh, through the social grapevine, and this was certainly true at Moscow University, it was remarkable how much information they ultimately would get from one guy who knew something who would tell somebody else and who would tell somebody else and so on and so forth. Uh, so Somehow or other, information vacuums tend to be filled. In the end, I think the Soviets pay a serious price for this uh, because when Gorbachev finally does level with the people about the fact that 
It's been a long, bloody war. We've taken a lot of casualties. Uh, it hasn't been a happy experience. Uh, an awful lot of folks are convinced at that point that the, uh, the Communist Party has outlived its usefulness. Uh, so they, they really did themselves an enormous disservice. I've covered that, so I want to scurry right along. Uh, one of the things the Soviets did in the meantime was to disseminate documents for international distribution, such as this one. This was among many things, many publications that I grabbed while I was at the university. Many of them were in Russian. Of course, nearly all were in Russian, but occasionally there'd be a nugget in English uh, that I could use for uh, uh, presentations like this. And, and this was essentially a compilation of all the official uh, statements by uh, Brezhnev and other uh, folks, uh, statements from the Politburo and whatnot about what was actually happening in Afghanistan from, uh, from their point of view. Uh, needless to say, the divergence between this and reality grew as the, uh, as the war proceeded. In the end, uh, the Soviets don't accomplish their objectives in Afghanistan. To a degree, this is attributable to uh, Western aid to the resistance. Uh, it's often noted that the uh, supply of Stinger missiles, for example, from the United States, uh, starting in about 85 or 86, limited the Soviet ability to conduct uh, helicopter uh, warfare, uh, air, air mobile warfare, and uh, to use uh, uh, combat aircraft. It's also true that the supply of weapons uh, to the Mujahideen mattered. Uh, what was perhaps even bigger uh, was that the program of migratory genocide that I talked about earlier blew up in the Soviets' face. When you stop and think about it, what better place could the Mujahideen possibly have to recruit fighters from than a population of four million fairly ticked off refugees living on the uh, other side of the Pakistan border in refugee camps? Uh, you've got a huge population of young combat age males uh, with nowhere to go and nothing to do and no opportunity uh, but an axe to grind. Uh, and the, uh, the Mujahideen will be well supported uh, with fighters. From, uh, from that base. So that really doesn't work out uh, for the Soviets. And the fact that it's in Pakistan uh, offers sanctuary to a great uh, part of the resistance. Uh, one template against which you can uh, look at the outcome of this war, and I'll use this as a kind of a closing point, and then I'll open the floor to questions, uh, is an idea uh, actually coined by uh, my good friend Dr. Tom Huber, who just happens to be sitting in the front row, uh, called Compound War. <laughs> and indeed, and in an even higher state, fortified uh, combat war. Uh, essentially, uh, what the resistance had going for it uh, were the following. Uh, they had a lot of capable guerrilla fighters. They had sanctuary across the frontier in Pakistan where the Soviets could occasionally cheat and conduct hot pursuit, but in general, they couldn't strike at the refugee camps. Moreover, they had the indirect support of a major regular force, the Soviet army, in the, in the largest part, is still tied down in Europe, holding the inter-German border, uh, eyeball to eyeball, with NATO forces. So that always restricts the Soviets' ability uh, to divert more strength uh, to Afghanistan. And then you have the diplomatic uh, and materiel leverage provided by the United States and others. Uh, United States with a lot of the technology, a lot of the money coming from Saudi Arabia, and a lot of the expertise and assistance on the ground uh, going through Pakistan. Uh, so the Soviets really have an awfully difficult problem uh, to try to deal with, and they're unable to successfully get over the top. Again, I also go back uh, to the initial conditions that they set for the war. The way they took over the government, uh, the way the PDPA had antagonized the population, the way the Soviet style of combat further antagonized the population uh, created a nearly impossible problem uh, that was going to be incredibly difficult to resolve by military means. Uh, to be sure, the Soviets accomplished a lot uh, tactically during the war, and they won a lot more fights uh, than they lost. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you achieve your political strategic objective, and they didn't. Gorbachev is the man, then, who finds the exit door for the Soviets. Uh, he's in an advantageous position to do this. He was not one of the inner circle who made the decision to go into Afghanistan. So he doesn't own the problem. It's not his fault. So he can make the step to withdraw. Furthermore, he now has every incentive to. Gorbachev has figured out, in a way that his predecessors had not, 
uh, that the war in Afghanistan was, uh, he used the expression at one point, a bleeding wound. It also prevented him from doing what he thought was necessary to get the Soviet Union out of its political and economic malaise. Uh, and that was engagement from the West. They needed a new dynamism. They needed new technology. They needed to break out of the old model of the Cold War. He couldn't do it, and he knew it, as long as they were in Afghanistan. Uh, so he's got both the motive and the opportunity to change political course, and he will. With that, I'll stop, and I'll be glad to entertain questions. Yes? Yeah. fundamentalist objection uh, in getting all the weapons uh, circulated through Pakistan uh, so he can divvy them out was, and this was in, in his process of Islamatizing all of Pakistan back in that day, his thought was that if he had all the weapons stockpiled, he can funnel those weapons out to the most Islamic fundamentalist groups with the best weapons in the greater numbers and then work his way down from there. That's largely the way it works out. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that's the entirety of his, uh, of his motivation. Uh, it's often pointed out also that uh, a lot of the groups that were most willing to fight happened to be those Islamist factions. Uh, so there's a combination of things. That's where his sympathies lay, but that's also um, where the largest number of folks who wanted to carry the fight to the Soviets could be found. Uh, so I think it was probably those two factors uh, that uh, influenced that a lot. I remember at the time that there seemed to be a lot of speculation in U.S. news um, in general about the fact that the Soviets were really after a deep uh, warm water port, et cetera. And in looking at the map again, of course, seeing that big swath of Pakistan that looked rather far-fetched, what's your take on that whole story that seemed to have a lot of credence at the time amongst the U.S. News? It did. Uh, and it certainly was uh, probably the biggest thing that created an alarm and and told U.S. policymakers we better do something. My feeling at the time, and my feeling when I wrote my uh, uh, book on uh, the war in Afghanistan, and, and still today, is that the Soviets were not doing this in order to get to, to take Iran and get the deep water port or, or somehow get, get farther south. This was really about Afghanistan in, in this case. The Soviets did not actually want to create the kind of international crisis that they created. Uh, and I think to the extent we've had archival releases since then of decision-making policy documents from the, from the Politburo, there's, there's nothing to suggest uh, that they had grander objectives uh, than Afghanistan. They simply wanted to keep Afghanistan in their orbit. Uh, and they were, after much deliberation, committed to doing that. Yes. Uh, did the Soviets send any political agents into Pakistan to create uh, a pro-Soviet uh, movement? Uh, they perhaps tried. I'm not aware of any major effort to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, Pakistan was not fertile soil for the Soviet uh, uh, message, and indeed there had been tensions uh, between uh, Pakistan and the Soviets. Uh, the Soviets also at that time had to be worried about uh, the Chinese response. A and indeed, in some of the early Politburo thinking, uh, uh, one or more uh, Soviet experts had offered the opinion, you know, if we invade Afghanistan and provoke the wrath of the United States and, and Pakistan, and this is going to be a real gift to China, which will be happy to pile on and make it that much harder uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, so the, the Soviet ability to influence what was going on in, Afghan in Pakistan sorry, was pretty limited. Uh, and they were also still trying to do what they could in, uh, in Iran, which was a highly volatile uh, situation. And if you recall in, uh, in Iran, the Soviets were often referred to as the, uh, the other great Satan. Uh, so uh, they had some public relations issues kind of across the, uh, the southern uh, periphery of the whole, whole country. The question was, what did the PDPA do about the ethnic divisions? Uh, they were not successful. In, uh, in dealing with all of that. Um, indeed, uh, the early politics of the PDPA had, in fact, to a degree, reinforced uh, ethnic division. Uh, so it was, uh, it was highly, uh, highly problematic. And once the Soviets invade, there, while there will be, uh, starting about 84, a campaign of national reconciliation, uh, 
so-called, uh, promulgated from the, from the government. And there will even be a change of leadership. When they decide that Babrat Karmal has lost all credibility, uh, they'll switch him out uh, with uh, Dr. Najibullah. Um, it's a fresh start, but not very fresh, because uh, he too is pretty well tied to the regime. They are, they are anchored by the past. And they're also, in a way, handicapped by the Soviet presence. The Soviet presence is uh, paradoxically a burden as well as a, a support. The Soviet invasion did one thing for the various resistance factions that could not have happened otherwise, and that is it, it caused them to, to unite. So they united across tribal and ethnic lines to fight Russians. Um, and one of the reasons that the PDPA regime would last a couple of years after the Soviet withdrawal is that when the Soviets pull out, these divisions are to some degree uh, moderated, and there's a, kind of a, a new round of jockeying for position uh, to see who's going who's to succeed in getting power. So it's a rather complicated position. But back to your starting question, uh, no, they didn't accomplish a whole lot. Not that they didn't make some effort, but they, they couldn't do it. Yes. Um, I, I can't help but notice the timing vis-a-vis -vis the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Was there any sense in the Russian military that they were not making the same mistake <clears throat> simply because the American mistake had been the jungle? And this was their chance to use the helicopters, use the technology, absent the jungle, so it was all going to turn out so much better. Uh, that, that's a, uh, a great question, and I think you're, uh, what you suggest is, is well taken. The Soviets were, of course, fully aware of what happened to uh, the U.S. in uh, Vietnam and how complicated uh, and troublesome that war became. They were pretty sure they could avoid those problems, and I think the, the difference in scenery uh, had a lot to do with it. Yeah, this is a war in a completely different environment. Um, but they'd also kind of deluded themselves into thinking but that, of course, you know, the cause of, uh, of North Vietnam and Vietcom, of course, that was, that was righteous, so of course the Americans would lose. Our cause here in Afghanistan is righteous, uh, so we'll be fine. Um, they managed to avoid drawing really serious comparisons uh, until they were staring them in the face. Uh, there were a few folks who early on saw this could be problematic, but for the most part, they couldn't sell it to the politicians who made the decisions. Uh, are, what lessons do you think our country could uh, <laughs> get from uh, the uh, Soviet experience? Well, uh, uh, that, that's probably a longer presentation than the one I just gave. Um, it's also pretty complicated. Um, what's clear in the aftermath of all that is that uh, Afghanistan is a pretty complicated place to work. It's a complicated place for Afghans to work. You've, You've never really had a highly functioning, centralized government in Afghanistan that enjoyed popular legitimacy across the country. So you're breaking all precedent just trying to do that. Um, because of all the historic uh, ethnic and tribal divisions, uh, the potential for insurgencies of one stripe or another uh, seems perpetually there. Uh, so you've got a, a really big problem uh, trying to surmount that. Um, in a way, the, uh, one of the greatest problems of the last decade uh, has been the legacy of the civil war in Afghanistan that followed the Soviet war. Afghanistan did not lapse into peace. It fell into a civil war um, where the factions redivided up and uh, fought one another for uh, control of Kabul. And that's what eventually put the Taliban in power in 1996. Um, and uh, interestingly, the, the, one of the reasons the Taliban collapsed so quickly when we arrived is that they'd been in power long enough to develop a track record so that most Afghan, Afghans could be satisfied, well, we really don't like these guys. So any change has, has got to be good. Um, and so we enjoyed the benefit of that wave uh, when, uh, when the United States entered. Now, so there are no really easy uh, solutions uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, you better, you got to bring a lot of patience. <laughs> and um, a lot, they're going to have to work some things out themselves uh, to a large degree. We have time for one more question. Sure. 
Uh, okay, okay. Could we have two? Because she's been waiting a while. Oh, okay, yeah. thank you. Well, how many wars have been fought in Afghanistan, it's like the U.S. and Russia, and have there been a lot of war nations fighting in Afghanistan, or just maybe talking about through uh, through history? Through history, oh, it's yeah, just it's just been the scene of uh, many wars. It, it's kind of a myth that Afghanistan has never really been conquered, um, but it is true it's never been conquered for long. Um, it's never been a particularly uh, uh, hospitable place for unwelcome foreigners to stay, uh, and the the warrior culture. Uh, grounded in tribalism in Afghanistan, uh, has uh, made them uh, capable of producing a, uh, a formidable uh, resistance. Um, very, uh, very, very difficult to, uh, to overcome. But there have been other periods. You know, if you go back to the pre-1978 period, uh, Afghanistan had had several decades of relative calm and, by local standards, prosperity. It's in a way, the Soviet invasion that, that tips them over the edge, because they were making little by little progress towards stability and, and, and modernization. And then uh, the whole thing unravels. And even as the U.S. comes in in, uh, in two, late uh, 2001, um, it's already still a highly uh, turbulent situation. It's, it's amazing uh, that the U.S. was able to establish the level of stability that it had. Well, since this is a, a seminar on history, uh, and we should uh, learn from history, historically, Alexander the Great didn't have any luck, Genghis Khan, and then the Soviets came in, and they ended up with 12 countries. And uh, we're there, and I'm wondering, what business are we, why are we there spending billions of dollars when it really has not been uh, a winning situation historically? Well, there's another question that uh, could probably take a, a long-winded answer. And uh, I guess my proper his uh, answer as a, as a historian is we'll have to wait and see uh, how, uh, uh, how this one comes up. Um, it's, uh, Afghanistan is an important regional strategic player, uh, however turbulent and troublesome uh, it might be. Uh, and outcomes in Afghanistan matter also uh, greatly to what happens in Pakistan, which is another important strategic, strategic player. Um, it's um, a region of the world uh, that is difficult to ignore, uh, even uh, uh, perhaps more than ever in the, in the current time frame. But the rest, uh, give me another 10 years to get some more perspective. Sorry about that uh, lame answer. 